To intubate means placing an endotracheal tube through the larynx and into the trachea. Indications for intubation include maintaining an open airway, providing positive pressure ventilation, protection from aspiration, helping to clear secretions when the patient can't clear his own, and ventilation for certain surgical procedures. Intubation is a life-saving skill, but it's only one way to ventilate during an emergency. Good ventilation itself should always take priority. The larynx is a cartilaginous structure at the top of the trachea that contains the vocal cords. In a young child, the larynx usually lies opposite the second and third cervical vertebrae. As we grow to adulthood, the larynx shifts downward to lie in front of the fourth through sixth cervical vertebrae, although it can remain higher. Having a larynx higher in the neck than average can make intubation more challenging, as we'll discuss later. The larynx lies anterior to the esophagus. The larynx functions as a sophisticated valve that lets us breathe, cough effectively, and swallow food and liquid without aspirating. Vibration of the vocal cords lets us vocalize sounds. The laryngeal skeleton is formed principally by the hyoid bone, the thyroid cartilage, and the cricoid cartilage. The hyoid bone is shaped like a horseshoe. The muscles of the neck support it, and it in turn supports the base of the tongue. You can feel the hyoid at the angle where the neck meets the chin. The thyroid cartilage, better known as the Adam's apple, is shield-shaped with a notch on its top edge. The thyrohyoid membrane connects it to the hyoid bone above. The thyroid cartilage forms an easily visible external neck bulge, more prominent in a man than a woman. The cricoid cartilage is right below the thyroid cartilage. The cricoid is a complete signet-shaped ring with its broad aspect posterior. You can easily feel the cricoid cartilage as a firm ridge three to four fingers breadths below the hyoid bone and three to four fingers breadths above the tracheal notch. The cricoid attaches to the thyroid cartilage laterally at two cricothyroid joints allowing both cartilages to move independently and as a unit as the muscles contract. The relatively avascular cricothyroid membrane connects the cricoid and thyroid cartilages anteriorly in the midline. Externally, the gap you can feel between these two cartilages is an important landmark for placement of an emergency airway cricothyrotomy. We'll discuss later how pressing on the cricoid and sometimes the thyroid cartilage can assist in a challenging intubation. For now, let's look at the internal structure of the larynx. The epiglottis is an important pharyngeal landmark during intubation. It's a curved leaf-shaped structure attached to the inside of the thyroid cartilage. Its upper rounded edge projects into the pharynx. The stalk at the base of the epiglottis allows it to fold over the glottis. This flexion helps protect from aspiration by directing food and liquid into the esophagus. The next key landmarks are the arytenoid cartilages. These irregular, pyramid-shaped cartilages sit on the upper posterior rim of the cricoid ring. Located on top of the arytenoids, the corniculate and cuneiform cartilages add bulk and shape to the mucosal covered arytenoid bulges. The vocal cords are ligaments that project forward from each arytenoid to the inside midpoint of the thyroid cartilage. <laughs> 
muscles move these arytenoids to tense, relax, and swing the vocal cords from side to side. The cords open on inhalation, they close on exhalation and when protecting the larynx. Vibration of the cords creates sound. Change in the tension or thickness of the cords alters pitch. And take a breath. Yeah. Uh, During swallowing, the whole larynx rises in the neck and the stalk at the base of the epiglottis allows it to fold over the glottis. This flexion helps protect from aspiration by directing food and liquid into the esophagus. However, the same flexibility can allow the epiglottis to fold over the larynx and block the view during intubation. This is a typical view of the larynx during intubation. Here you can see the curved epiglottis above, the bulges of the arytenoids below. The triangular gap between the vocal cords is called the glottis. Above and to the sides of the true vocal cords are the false vocal cords. Look how close the esophagus is to the larynx. Some landmarks may be partially hidden during a difficult intubation, so it's important to be able to recognize them even in partial view. The larynx is an active structure. Laryngospasm, an intense reflex protective closure of the vocal cords, is a good example of just how dynamic the larynx actually is. This is laryngospasm, caused in this case by the endotracheal tube touching the left arytenoid in a patient who was lightly anesthetized. Watch closure of the vocal cords, closure of the false cords, and mounding of the paraglottic tissues by elevation of the larynx. It typically occurs by stimulating the vocal cords while the patient is semi-conscious. When you see laryngospasm, don't force the endotracheal tube through the glottis because you could traumatize the larynx. Instead, stop and break the laryngospasm either through the use of positive pressure ventilation, sedative medications, or muscle relaxants. The larynx slides up and down with swallowing. You can also push it from side to side. In fact, intubation can be difficult if tumor, swelling, or scar fixes the larynx in place and prevents this movement. Placement of an endotracheal tube through the larynx interferes with its natural protective functions of breathing and protection from aspiration. The act of intubating is stressful. You must guard against hypertension and tachycardia with their attendant complications. Intubation also carries the potential for inflicting physical trauma on the airway. Therefore, you must be prepared to perform the intubation as quickly as possible while safeguarding your patient from possible harm. Check that your equipment is present and functioning prior to use to avoid delay or equipment failure at a critical moment. We use a laryngoscope to expose and illuminate the larynx during oral intubation a technique called direct laryngoscopy. The laryngoscope comes in two pieces, a handle with a power source and a blade with a light source. There are many different types of laryngoscope blades, however the curved Macintosh blade and the straight Miller blade are commonly used. Each has advantages and disadvantages in certain clinical situations. Optimally have both types available and know how to use them. To assemble the laryngoscope, hook the flange on the blade under the post on the handle and snap it into place. To turn on the light, pull the blade into a right angle with the handle until it locks. Conversely, folding the blade towards the handle turns off the light and allows you to remove the blade. Light bulbs can burn out. Evaluate the brightness of the light. Make sure any light bulb is tightly screwed in. If you're using a fiber optic blade, you won't have a light bulb, but the battery can still fail. Routinely check your equipment to ensure it's ready when needed. Always have a second blade and handle available. 
troubleshooting in the middle of an intubation should be avoided. This is a standard cuffed adult endotracheal tube. Although specialized endotracheal tubes exist, this is the type you'll use most often. The tube size indicates the internal diameter of the tube in millimeters. Women usually use a size between 7 and 8, men between 8 and 8.5. And the tube markings in centimeters allow you to insert the tube to the correct depth and then monitor that it stays there. The larger the tube you insert, the less resistance to breathing there is and the easier it is to keep the tube clear of secretions. Have smaller sizes available, especially in the presence of trauma or swelling. The endotracheal tube has two openings on the patient end. The side opening, called a Murphy eye, prevents obstruction when the tip of the endotracheal tube is up against the tracheal wall. The beveled tip serves the same purpose when the tip is up against the carina. Positive pressure ventilation depends on providing enough pressure to inflate the lungs. If there is a break in the pressure seal, such as through a leak around the endotracheal tube, then ventilation may be inadequate and the patient can potentially aspirate around the tube. We use cuffed endotracheal tubes to provide this seal in adults, but not usually in infants and small children because their larynxes are anatomically different. In a child younger than about eight, the smallest diameter of the airway is the cricoid ring. A properly sized round endotracheal tube will seal this round cricoid opening. And using an uncuffed tube allows us to use a slightly larger size and therefore avoid higher resistance to breathing. In an adult or child older than about eight, the opening through the vocal cords is smaller than the cricoid. The vocal cord gap is triangular in shape and a round tube won't seal it. Therefore, a cuff below the cords is now needed to provide the seal. Other differences in pediatric airway anatomy and intubation technique are too numerous to discuss here. Always test the endotracheal tube cuff for leaks before use by filling it with air through the pilot balloon. Leave the tube partially inside its wrapper to keep it clean. Detach the syringe to ensure that the pilot tube itself doesn't leak. Deflate the cuff before use. Never try to intubate with the cuff inflated. A stylet is a rod of flexible metal used to maintain the desired curve of a tube for ease of insertion into the trachea. Make sure the stylet slides in and out easily. You may lubricate the stylet with water or water-soluble gel if desired. Make sure the stylet does not pass through the Murphy eye or out the end of the tube where it could injure the trachea. To prevent the stylet from sliding past the tip of the endotracheal tube, place a bend at the top to fix it in position. We commonly flex the tip like a hockey stick with the rest of the tube fairly straight. Since the stylet makes the tracheal tube rigid, be gentle when using one. Always have a suction device available. Blood or other secretions can cause aspiration or obstruct your view. Ventilating the patient is especially important. While the absence of an endotracheal tube rarely harms a patient, the absence of adequate ventilation can. Always be prepared with a ventilation bag and mask device and oral airways. Intubation is not a one-person job. Try to have a helper present. To intubate, you need to bring the path from the incisor teeth to the larynx into a reasonably straight line. This path has three axes, the oral axis, the pharyngeal axis, and the laryngeal axis. Since these axes don't naturally line up, aligning the axes requires optimally positioning the patient's head and neck and then using the laryngoscope and blade to make the final adjustment. Optimizing head position is a key step for success. In the absence of potential cervical spine injury, place the head in the sniffing position, with the head raised about 10 centimeters or 4 inches off the bed and tilted slightly back. The sniffing position typically places the mastoid process in line with the top of the chest.
the laryngoscope blade then lifts the mandible to bring the oral axis in line with the other two. The larynx usually comes into view. Other techniques can be used in situations when the patient's head and neck should not be moved, such as cervical trauma. Turn on your laryngoscope and position your endotracheal tube in an easily reached location. If you're using a stylet, this should already be in the tube and bent as desired. Tilt the head into extension and stabilize it. Open the mouth using your right hand as far to the right side of the mouth as possible. Your thumb is on the lower teeth and your middle or index finger is on the upper teeth. This position is similar to snapping your fingers. By pushing rather than spreading, you can open the mouth wider and more forcefully. Grasp the handle in your left hand with the blade down and pointing away from you. Insert the blade to the right side of the mouth and tongue. Control of the tongue is key. Placing the blade in the middle of the tongue can cause the tongue to block your view and leave you with no room to pass the tube. As you start to slide the blade and tongue toward the left side of the mouth, slowly advance the blade until you can see the tip of the epiglottis. Lift the lower jaw upward holding your left arm slightly bent and fairly rigid. This position gives you the strength of your shoulders and back to lift, not just your forearm, helps prevent using the teeth as a fulcrum, and allows you to use binocular vision for depth perception. Be careful. Don't press on the teeth or pinch the lips between the blade and the teeth. The head is now suspended from the laryngoscope in the left hand. Pick up the tube with your right hand. You can also ask your assistant to hand it to you in the correct orientation for insertion. You should keep your eyes on the trachea. Hold the preselected tube in your right hand like a pencil, curved forward. Pass the tube to the right of the blade, into the larynx through the cords. If the patient is breathing, time the thrust for inspiration when the cords are most open. Watch the tube pass through the cords if you can. While there may be a blind spot at the moment of entering the larynx, you can often see the arytenoids behind the tube. Let's watch this clip again. Notice that, as sometimes happens, the tube had to be redirected to line it up with the opening. You need to be gentle as forcefully bumping into the larynx multiple times might cause trauma, bleeding, or swelling. Stop advancing when the cuff is beyond the cords. This usually is about 21 centimeters deep at the teeth for a woman, 22 centimeters for a man. Remove the blade carefully while holding the tube securely with the right hand. Fill the cuff with air slowly until you feel a small amount of back pressure and any leak of air around the cuff stops. A properly inflated cuff seals the trachea at an inflation pressure of about 20 centimeters of water pressure in order to ventilate effectively and seal against aspiration. Usually six to seven milliliters of air is enough. Don't overfill. The pilot balloon should not be tense. In this demonstration, you can see how the cuff conforms to the wall. Here an additional 20 milliliters of air has been added. You can see how easy it would be to overinflate, possibly damaging the tracheal wall. Never assume the tube is in the trachea unless verified. Listen for breath sounds. It's helpful to have terminology to describe the view you see during intubation to other providers in order to get their help, as well as to alert them to future problems. With a grade one view, you can see the entire laryngeal outlet. In a grade two view, some, but not all, of the vocal cords are visible. With grade three, you can see the back of the epiglottis and the arytenoids, but none of the cords. You can only see the back of the epiglottis with a grade four view, the most difficult. Let's look at some techniques used to improve the view during your laryngoscopy and to make intubation easier.
Head position and movement of surrounding tissues shifts cartilages and may affect your ability to see the vocal cords. Sometimes the larynx lies anterior to your field of view during laryngoscopy. This is a so-called anterior larynx and it occurs with poor head positioning as well as in patients with obesity, larynx is located higher in the neck than average, and in patients with poorly developed mandibles or weak chins. If you can't see the vocal cords during intubation, have an assistant provide cricoid pressure. The thumb and index finger straddle the cricoid ring and push the cricoid cartilage downward firmly but gently against the vertebral column. If pressing down on the cricoid fails to improve the view, have your helper apply pressure on the thyroid cartilage aiming backwards down against the vertebral column, rightward towards the patient's right side, upwards toward you. This maneuver is called burp, B-U-R-P. In either case, if your helper also pulls the patient's right cheek outward to improve your field of view, this gives you maximum room to maneuver and see the landmarks. Here is a view of the larynx during laryngoscopy as the assistant applies cricoid pressure. Notice how cricoid pressure brings the larynx down and into the field of view. Cricoid pressure is one of the most valuable aids to improve visualization of a larynx. Cricoid pressure can also be used to seal the esophagus during emergency intubation to help prevent aspiration. Watch again how the application of cricoid pressure turns a grade 4 view into a grade 1 view. A sharply bent stylet can sometimes prevent advancing the tube. If this happens, hold the tube firmly and back the stylet out several centimeters with your thumb. Push the tube forward into the trachea once the tip is free to flex. You may need a helper to pull the stylet out for you while you hold the tube and advance it. There are two major types of laryngoscope blade, curved and straight. Technique used varies slightly with each, so let's look at the differences and review intubation again in the process. This is a curved Macintosh blade. Note the position of the light source, the broad, flat blade width, the tall flange for positioning the tongue, and the overall curved shape. With the tip in the vollecula, lifting the tongue pulls on tissue folds attached at its base. This lifts the epiglottis passively, exposing the cords. Use of the curved blade depends on being able to physically displace the base of the tongue and surrounding tissues forward. As you might imagine, conditions such as morbid obesity or tumor of the tongue might make displacing the tongue more difficult, and a curved blade therefore potentially less successful than a straight blade which does not rely on such displacement. This is a view of the larynx using the curved blade. The epiglottis is visible because the tip of the blade is in the vollecula behind it. The curved blade's broader base is more forgiving of less optimal placement, making it useful when the patient is in an awkward position. There's also more room to maneuver a large tube or a double lumen tube. A straight blade, like the Miller, has a narrow blade width. The light source is positioned towards the end. Note the curved central channel and the overall straight shape. This blade physically picks up the epiglottis and flattens the tongue. The straight blade is often better for situations with little room to displace the tongue and attached tissues forward, such as the patient with a hypoplastic jaw or weak chin, the pediatric patient, and other patients with larynxes positioned higher in the neck. It's also useful for obese patients and patients with larynxes fixed by tumor, edema, or mass effect. This is the view commonly seen with a straight blade. You can't see the epiglottis because it's under the blade and therefore out of the picture. Here you can see the difference in the final position of the straight and the curved blades with respect to the epiglottis.
Here, the two laryngoscopic views are compared. It's important to master both types of blades because there will always be situations where one blade will be more successful than the other. In the event you can't intubate easily, stop after 30 to 60 seconds. Ventilate the patient briefly before your next attempt in order to maintain oxygenation. As long as you can ventilate the patient, you have time. Time to alter your technique, change the position of the head, or use a different type of laryngoscope blade. Keep your suction handy and use it, and don't be afraid to ask for help. After intubation, you need to stabilize the endotracheal tube before taping it, and also every time you move the patient. Hold the tube where it exits from the mouth, resting your hand on the cheek. Extubation is more likely if you hold the adapter end of the tube because it's less secure in the event of unexpected movement. Unless there's a need to place the tube midline, tape it towards the side of the mouth. It's more stable and comfortable for the patient, and suctioning the mouth is easier. Don't let the tube overlie the tongue. If it does, you risk accidental extubation because less tube is inserted into the trachea, despite the fact that the numbers at the lip in this situation inaccurately indicate an adequate depth of insertion. The correct position of the endotracheal tube places the cuff below the cords and the tip midway down the trachea to the carina. After intubation, immediately check that the tube is correctly positioned in the trachea, not in the esophagus or main stem bronchus. Listen over both sides of the chest. Unless there is pathology, you should hear breath sounds on both sides. When the tube is too far down one side of the trachea, it will lie in one main stem bronchus and block the other. This is called a main stem intubation. In this case, you ventilate only one lung and you will hear breath sounds on only one side of the chest. The chest will rise unevenly. Slowly pull the tube back while listening until breath sounds appear on both sides. Remember, however, that pneumothorax, pneumonia, pleural effusion, and having had a pneumonectomy are other causes of unilateral breath sounds. If the tube seems to be at the correct depth, tape it in place and wait until you get a chest x-ray. In addition to checking to ensure that the tube is not too deep, also make sure that the cuff is not too high and that it's below the cricoid ring. If the cuff sits partially inside the rigid cricoid, it can press on and potentially injure the recurrent laryngeal nerves, causing either transient or possibly permanent vocal cord paralysis. If the cuff is above the cords, there's a high risk of accidental extubation. When properly positioned, squeezing the pilot balloon will allow you to feel the cuff move slightly at the tracheal notch. You should not hear gurgling over the stomach. Gurgling is a sign of esophageal intubation. If you recognize an esophageal intubation, remove the endotracheal tube, ventilate the patient, and begin again. Other verifying signs of correct tracheal placement include watching the chest rise when you squeeze the ventilation bag. Feeling air move in and out of the endotracheal tube if the patient is breathing spontaneously. An end tidal CO2 apparatus will be able to measure CO2. And an awake patient will not be able to speak with the cuff inflated. Additionally, in the emergency situation, watch for the oxygen saturation to rise, the heart rate and blood pressure to stabilize, and for the skin color to improve. It can sometimes be difficult to verify endotracheal tube placement when there is poor airflow or poorly heard breath sounds. It may be hard to hear breath sounds in the morbidly obese patient due to overlying fat tissue and poor chest expansion. Severe bronchospasm produces very poor airflow. In severe emphysema or COPD, air sounds are poorly transmitted 
due to the loss of alveoli. Breath sounds are transmitted broadly in very young children, making it easy to hear breath sounds over the entire lower trunk. Esophageal intubation can sometimes sound like muffled breath sounds in such a situation. A leak around the cuff can be caused by the cuff needing more air, a hole in the cuff, a faulty pilot balloon, or a cuff above the quartz. In the case of a cuff above the quartz, the risk of an unplanned extubation is high. With a faulty cuff or pilot balloon, reinflation of the pilot balloon temporarily fixes the problem, but the pilot balloon becomes soft again as the cuff deflates. If the pilot balloon is faulty, attaching a closed stopcock after reinflation will often solve the problem. If the cuff itself is leaking, the tube will need replacement. If the cuff is above the cords, however, there is a persistent leak despite repeated cuff inflation. However, in this case, the pilot balloon becomes increasingly distended, tense, and holds pressure. The cuff is above the cords on laryngoscopy. If the cuff is above the cords, there is a significant risk of extubation because only the tip of the tube is through the glottis. In this case, make sure you have the equipment for reintubation immediately available. Suction the patient's mouth. It may take more than one aspiration to deflate the cuff if the balloon has become overdistended with all of the attempts to seal the leak. Gently advance the tube to the proper depth. Immediately re-verify proper placement. The tube can sometimes slip off the back of the larynx into the esophagus with this manipulation. Flexing or extending the neck of a patient with possible cervical spine injury can cause permanent injury or paralysis. Often such patients are intubated awake by experienced intubators with specialized equipment. If you need to immediately intubate such a patient, have a trained assistant stabilize the head and neck in a neutral position while you intubate. Lift only the mandible, not the head and neck. Gentle cricoid pressure may help, but this must be used as a last resort and with caution to avoid potentially displacing any cervical vertebrae. If you can't intubate easily, then ventilate using a mask or a laryngeal mask airway or an esophageal obturator airway until advanced airway techniques are available. In the can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario, emergency cricothyrotomy may be the fastest and safest means of securing the airway. Although a few patients are difficult to intubate because of their anatomy, error in technique commonly causes difficult intubations. First, it's normal to be nervous. Don't let it interfere with your ability to act. The risk of injuring the patient is low when you ventilate the patient between attempts and use gentle technique. If the head is not optimally positioned, the larynx may appear more anterior on laryngoscopy. Cricoid pressure may help. Very anterior. She's not in a terrific sniffing position, so putting another pillow under her head might be good too. Give me some pressure right there. Right there? Poor head positioning often forces the intubator to lift and hold the head several inches in order to visualize the larynx. If you don't have folded towels or the strength to lift the head into the sniffing position, use a helper to lift and stabilize the head. It's essential that the helper hold the head steady. Unexpected movement can break teeth. Beginners commonly lose control of the tongue. Placing the blade in the middle of the tongue forces the tissue to mound up and block the view. Slide the blade and tongue toward the left side of the mouth. Placing the blade too far to the right does not leave you with enough space to insert the tube. The cheek blocks your view. Have your assistant gently pull the cheek out of your way if this happens. Don't rotate your wrist. It's very easy to break teeth if you're not careful. <laughs>
Patients may have loose teeth. When patients are missing their front teeth, the intubator can often get a great view of the larynx while the mouth is only partially open. However, they then find the side teeth are in the way for passing the tube. Lift upward to more fully open the mouth. It's quite possible to insert your blade too deep and into the esophagus. If you can't identify landmarks, slowly pull the blade back as you watch. Often the glottis will drop into your field of view. Now that you know how intubation is performed, you'll be better able to predict situations when intubation might be difficult. Performing a thorough airway assessment of a critically ill patient in an emergency situation is not always feasible, although it can be helpful when it's practical to do so. Have your patient open their mouth and measure the opening. You should be able to insert three fingers in the average adult. Less than three fingers breaths may mean difficulty. Look at the posterior pharynx at the uvula and tonsillar pillars. These signs are called malampati signs after the physician who first described them. In a malampati class 1, you can see all of the uvula and tonsillar pillars. A class 2, you can see most of them. Typically, if you can see most of the uvula and the tonsillar pillars, then the patient should be easy to intubate. When you can only see the base of the uvula or no landmarks at all, then this is a malampati 3 or 4 patient. Visualization of the larynx can be difficult in these patients because it implies difficulty in displacing the tissue forward with the blade. Have your patient slide their lower jaw over their upper. Inability to do so may make it hard to displace the jaw. If the distance inside the mandible to the hyoid bone is less than three finger breaths, then the larynx is positioned higher in the neck than average. This can also make intubation more challenging because there is less space to displace the tongue and other tissues forward. Have your patient extend and flex their head on their neck. Is there restriction of motion? Poor mobility of the head, jaw, or neck can make it hard to bring the axes of the larynx into alignment and the larynx into view. Pathologic conditions that can make intubation challenging include, among other things, morbid obesity, infections such as epiglottitis or pharyngeal abscess, trauma, edema, tumor, and congenital deformities. Recognition of any of these warning signs should allow you to better prepare for the difficult intubation. These signs are not 100% predictive and should be used in conjunction with the rest of the airway exam. This is especially true in the morbidly obese patient where collapse of extrapharyngeal soft tissue resulting from loss of consciousness may occasionally obscure your views of the larynx even in the malampati 1 and 2 patient. Complications can occur during and following intubation. First of all, the process of intubation can delay ventilation and can result in inadequate oxygenation, hypercarbia, or interruption of CPR for greater than 15 seconds. In addition, the stress of the intubation can cause physiological responses that can put the patient at risk. For example, hypertension and tachycardia can increase the risk of heart attack and stroke. Complications are more likely to occur in difficult intubations and emergency situations where distractions can interfere and poor intubating conditions, such as patient position and poor ambient lighting, are likely to exist. Potential complications include tooth trauma, eye trauma, esophageal intubation, bronchospasm, endobronchial or mainstem intubation, premature or unintended extubation, aspiration, pneumothorax, spinal cord injury, increased intracranial pressure, and loss of the airway and airway obstruction, which if uncorrected can lead to hypoxic injury and death. To extubate is to remove the endotracheal tube. An endotracheal tube is uncomfortable for the awake patient and can potentially cause trauma.
You should remove the endotracheal tube as soon as your patient is able to breathe without help and can protect his own airway. Your patient must be hemodynamically stable. In addition, any airway pathology should no longer pose a threat. However, extubation carries risks and must be approached with caution, especially in the patient who is difficult to intubate or who has risk of airway obstruction. Removing the tube too soon can precipitate airway obstruction or respiratory failure, possibly requiring urgent reintubation. Evaluate your patient prior to extubation for resolution of any significant airway edema or bleeding, recovery of airway reflexes in response to command, absence of significant hypoxia, hypercarbia, or major acid-base imbalance, hemodynamic instability, estimated inspiratory capacity of at least 15 milliliters per kilogram, signs of intact muscle power, and absence of retraction during spontaneous respiration. Suction the pharynx well prior to extubation. Leave the cuff inflated until you're about to remove it to prevent oral secretions from draining into the trachea around the tube. If you need to suction secretions out of the endotracheal tube itself, oxygenate the patient well beforehand. To avoid hypoxia, limit the time spent suctioning to less than 10 seconds. Make multiple passes if necessary and oxygenate the patient between each pass. After suctioning and oxygenating, untape the tube. Have the patient take a deep breath. I want you to take a real deep breath for me again. Deep breath in. Or assist the patient manually to take a deep breath. Deflate the cuff and remove it quickly. The order of steps is important. The patient will often cough immediately following extubation. A cough requires an inhalation followed by an exhalation. Having the patient's lung fully inflated ensures that when the cough comes, all secretions will be blown out of the airway rather than sucked deeper into the lungs. Extubation is a potentially dangerous time. Have suction, oxygen, and the means to reintubate the patient immediately available. Apart from vomiting and aspiration, the most serious complications following extubation include laryngospasm, post-obstructive pulmonary edema, post-extubation croup, and respiratory insufficiency. Laryngospasm is reflex spasmodic closure of the vocal cords. It can occur when the vocal cords are stimulated in a semi-conscious patient, such as stage two of an anesthetic induction or emergence a time when airway protective reflexes are hyperactive. Early extubation is one common cause. If laryngospasm occurs, suction the airway clear of secretions, use jaw thrust, and apply positive pressure ventilation administered by bag valve mask. If the spasm doesn't break, sedative drugs and or muscle relaxants may be needed. To prevent laryngospasm, ensure the pharynx is clear of secretions, avoid stimulating the vocal cords in a semi-conscious patient, and extubate the patient either awake or in a deep plane of anesthesia, but not semi-conscious or in stage two. Patients with post-obstructive pulmonary edema, or POP, develop sudden, unexpected, and potentially life-threatening pulmonary edema after relief of airway obstruction. POP type one follows acute airway obstruction POPE type 2, which is much less common, develops after surgical relief of chronic upper airway obstruction, such as tumor. POPE 1 occurs when forceful attempts to inhale against an obstruction create highly negative intrathoracic pressure. This in turn increases venous return, decreases cardiac output, and forces intravascular fluid to shift into the alveolar space in the lungs. The typical Pope patient is young, healthy, and strong. A common case history for Pope type 1 is the patient who goes into laryngospasm immediately following extubation, resulting in transient airway obstruction. The patient then complains of dyspnea and respiratory distress. Symptoms range from mild, unexplained hypoxemia to severe, 
requiring reintubation and ventilatory support. Clinical signs include tachypnea, tachycardia, RALS, and ronchi. Symptoms usually begin within an hour, but have been reported as late as six hours. Treatment consists of supplemental oxygen and support. Reintubation may be required with provision of low levels of positive end expiratory pressure. Full and rapid recovery can be expected with appropriate management. Post extubation croup is caused by inflammation of the subglottic region due to mechanical irritation from the endotracheal tube. It's most common in children one to four years old. Other contributing factors include trauma during intubation, a tight fitting tube with no leak at 25 to 40 centimeters of water pressure, surgery in the neck region, children with previous history of croup, and a duration of intubation of more than one hour. The problem is the effect of a small amount of edema on the diameter of the subglottic space. One millimeter of circumferential edema in an average adult with a 10 millimeter cricoid opening reduces that opening 20%, leaving considerable reserve. The same one millimeter circumferential edema in a baby's three millimeter cricoid reduces the opening by almost 70%. Treatment includes humidified oxygen and aerosolized racemic epinephrine, which helps to shrink the mucous membrane. Because swelling can worsen again after the epinephrine effect wears off, it's important to continue to observe the patient for recurrence. If obstructive symptoms are severe and do not resolve with treatment, the patient may need to be reintubated until swelling resolves. Every patient should be monitored in the immediate post-extubation period for potential respiratory insufficiency or obstruction. Early recognition and treatment of respiratory compromise is essential. Successful placement of an endotracheal tube through the larynx and into the trachea depends on an intimate knowledge of the anatomy of the larynx and an appreciation for its dynamic structure and relationships. Your mastery of intubation technique will require careful attention to your equipment, understanding how to use the laryngoscope to manipulate the anatomy and visualize the larynx, Selecting the curved or straight laryngoscope blade based on its utility in particular clinical situations. Knowing how to verify tube placement and correct misplacement. using tactics to improve your visualization of the larynx when it's less than optimal, learning to avoid common errors, and knowing when and how to extubate. Complications can occur even with perfect medical management, and you must know how to recognize and to treat them. However, preparation, gentle technique, and attention to total patient well-being minimizes the risk.